In this lesson, we're going to talk about water as it relates to cultural, social, political, legal aspects. We tend to think of water as a right. We tend to think that water should be free. But if we think about it, if we want to have the water in a convenient location, if we want the water to come to our home, and if we want that water to be safe, maybe the water itself is free, but the convenience and the safety factor is what we're paying for. So we should be willing to think about paying for water in that context. And if we think about water and risk, risk is an interesting thing. People are willing to accept certain levels of risk for different activities. For example, when it comes to individual choices, what we eat, what we drink, uh, our hobbies, uh, how we get around transportation, we're often able and willing to accept higher levels of risk than things that are, are forced upon us. For example, water. And it turns out that water tends to pose a very low risk, but people are very concerned about that level of risk because it's not a choice. Uh, they don't have a choice of their water. So when we think about setting risk standards for water, we think about risk of a one in a million death due to unsafe water, due to cancer that may come from drinking that water, when in actuality the risk we end up experiencing from other factors like transportation and other things turns out to be even higher than that. But those are choices. So that's an interesting element of water and the human factor. Another aspect of, of water and people is water and gender. And this becomes a factor, especially in developing countries, where people don't have the convenience of water coming to their home. Uh, people have to walk some distance to get water, and that water may not be safe. And often in Ethiopia, in, in Africa, in, in um, Bangladesh, different places I've been, it's the women and the young girls that are walking a kilometer, several kilometers, to get water, to bring it back to their home. And they have to do this many times. I remember the lady in Guatemala that said, oh, when I asked where her water comes from, she said, oh, it comes from far. And I asked, how far? She said, several kilometers. And I said, well, how many times a day? Two, three, no, five, ten times a day, back and forth, that distance uh, for water. And so the girls can't go to school because they're busy just keeping enough water uh, to keep the family alive. And when the girls get to a certain age, when they approach puberty, if there's not sanitation facilities, um, facilities for sanitation in the schools, the girls are unwilling to go. And so water sanitation turns out to have interesting gender issues, especially in developing countries. Water also appears in various religions as an important element. For example, we know um, holy water is an important topic in Christianity, Sikhism, Hinduism. Different religions have different sacred bodies of water. The Jordan River in Christianity, the Zamzam well in Islam, the River Ganges in Hinduism. Ritual washing, it's sometimes called ablution. Christianity, Hinduism, Buddhism, Sikhism, Judaism, Islam, Baha'i, Shinto, Taoism. In certain religions, there are, are certain cultures, there are water deities. Uh, the Celtic Sulis worshipped at the thermal spring at Bath, or the Ganges in Hinduism. Uh, the Hindu goddess Saraswati, uh, personification of the, of the river by the same name. And African examples include the Yoruba River goddess Oshun and the Igbo Lake goddess Ogbubi. Then when we begin to look at the legal and political side of things, uh, we get in the issues of water rights and water laws. And I'm going to use the example of the United States, which has two basic types of laws, regulations. In the eastern part of the United States, Water rights are appropriated based upon what we call riparian rights. A riparian comes from located alongside or located alongside the river. And so you have rights to the water that are flow along your property, if you will. In the western part of the United States, we have uh, the law of prior appropriation, uh, the first in use. If you were the first to use a water, 
uh, you have access to that water. And so you can see that between the eastern and the western parts there are different approaches. And this leads to some challenges in terms of understanding and implementing access to water. So across the United States there can be a variety of federal, state, local, and even in some instances American Indian law that come into play in determining rights and access to water. An interesting example of this is California versus Arizona and the broader Colorado River question. Uh, determining the appropriation of water from the Colorado River across a number of states. And this led to the point where a number of Supreme Court rulings came into existence to help determine the appropriations of water amongst these various bodies. This illustrates the importance for water regulation and water law. And let me share some examples of uh, U.S. water regulations over time. Congress first addressed water pollution issues in the Rivers and Harbors Act of 1899, giving the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers the authority to regulate most kinds of obstructions to navigation, including hazards resulting from uh, effluents, discharges into the rivers. This focused on interstate waters, waters that flowed in between states or between states. Now, the Public Health Service Act of 1912 expanded the mission of the United States Public Health Service to study problems of sanitation, sewage, and pollution. The Federal Water Pollution Control Act of 1948 created a comprehensive set of water quality programs that also provided financing for state and local governments. And again, this focused on interstate waters, waters between states, not within states. The Water Quality Act of 1965 required states to issue water quality standards for, again, interstate waters. And notice the focus on interstate. And authorized newly created Federal Water Pollution Control Administration to set standards where the states failed to do so. The Environmental Protection Agency was formed in 1970. And the Clean Water Act of 1977 helped to encourage and identify and motivate the use of best available technologies to help treat water uh, with a focus on potentially concerning toxic substances that might be in the water. So you can see over time there's been an evolution of U.S. regulations regarding water with an early focus on interstate waters, but over time the um, Environmental Protection Agency beginning to set regulations that were enforced even within states to make sure there were standards across the United States that were upheld. The states have to meet at least the minimum standards of the U.S. government regulations, but can set even more stringent standards if they cho so choose to. And these water regulations help to provide safe water, help to address potential disputes within and between states, and help provide this vital, precious resource that's so important to life as we know it. 